Hey everyone, happy Wednesday and welcome to another episode of Backstage Pass where I get to talk to my amazing friends and really sort of get to know how they got to where they are and what their passions are, what makes them tick, what they want to do in this world, sort of a behind the scenes of their lives, behind their public personas. And today I'm really excited because we have, um, it's not a musician today, but rather someone I met concerts in February in Tampa with the Florida Orchestra. And I want to welcome, so there she is. Hey, Nicole, how are you? Hey, good, good. I'm in kind of this weird, glowy, strange light here. <laughs> That's okay. Be all glowy and strange. We love uh. it. So good to see you. So this is Nicole yeah, Stott, and uh, welcome to Backstage Pass. And I'm so excited you're doing this because I've had all musicians up to now. And I was like, we want to sort of, you know, branch out and do someone else. And I've got a, a real live astronaut. Um, yeah, so I'm not a musician. <laughs> <laughs> but we met doing a concert. We did. So we made that connection, right? So I'm just going to do a brief bio that I have of you. So you've spent 28 years with NASA, um, starting at the Kennedy Space Center. You've, hold, you've held like an amazing number of positions with the shuttle program, including shuttle flow director, orbiter project, project engineer. You worked for as part of the ISS hardware integration office. Um, then you transitioned to the Johnson Space Center, worked as a flight simulation engineer, um, and then you were selected to be a Na NASA astronaut in 2000, crew member. You were a crew member on the Extreme Environment Mission, NEMO, NEMO 9. Yeah. Uh, so you're an aquanaut as well. Uh, mm -hmm. On 2009 and 11, you were aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery on the International Space Station, um, and you were also an artist and uh, have, have, you've combined your artwork and spaceflight experiences to create, inspire creative thinking and solutions. And we're gonna talk about that through um, uh, the exciting things that you're doing now. So that's just a lot of information that I <laughs> everyone. Sorry, I was like trying to spit it out as quickly as possible so I can get to the really interesting part. So let me start by asking you, were you one of those kids who said, when I grow up, I wanna be an astronaut? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I have memory of watching the moon landing, you know, with my family. I think it was six or seven. And, but I think even at six or seven, you realize that's a really extraordinary thing to, you know, to see happening, you know, mm -hmm. people walking on the moon. And um, so I think I was inspired by it, but it was a really long time before I thought that astronaut was something that could be real. Mm -hmm. I went more down a path of wanting to know how things fly, you know, if you want to know how airplanes fly, why would you not want to know how rocket ships fly? And that, that kind of indirectly led me there. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't know about you, but I mean, one of the things that um, probably kept me from thinking about it sooner was mm -hmm. not that anybody told me I couldn't do it, mm -hmm. but I just always thought, oh, that's something other special people get to do. Why would they mm -hmm. ever mm -hmm. think? <laughs> so, Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, huh. So you went into engineering before that was that was the first iteration of of nicole right so you went to school for engineering i think people have this misconception that if you're an astronaut that's your job as if just flying to space is your sole job but you have to do other things that's, that's where your specialties are and so how did you get into engineering so you like to see how planes flew and how things worked and how did that lead directly into that yeah. So, you know, growing up, I, you know, I, I thank my parents really for sharing what they loved with me. I, my mom, very creative person. My dad loved to fly, to build and fly small airplanes. And so as kids, we spent, you know, our whole childhood out at the airport growing up. That's where I developed the love for flying thing, I think. And, um, and I wanted to fly myself, but I really mm. wanted to know how things fly. So, that led me to aeronautical engineering, studying that at school. Um, where I grew up and went to school is right here in kind of in Florida, right across the you know state where they were launching, starting to launch space shuttles again, and uh, and that's where I wanted to work. I mean, I knew I wanted to work for NASA as an engineer, mm -hmm. okay. and and like you said, you know, I think the thing where I started realizing, oh, maybe I could consider this astronaut job mm -hmm. was as I was helping get space shuttles ready for other astronauts to fly on, mm -hmm. I started seeing that, well, you know, 99.9% .9 of an astronaut's job is not flying in space. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's sadly, it's not, you yeah, know, it's yeah. down here on earth and at least 80% of that job was a lot like what I was doing already as a NASA engineer. 
And so when they made their next call, I applied because people that I consider to be mentors encouraged me to pick up the pen and apply. And so, um, yeah, once you get selected to be an astronaut, it's a lot of training, of course, you know, mm -hmm. for the spacecraft you're going to fly on. And then when you get an assignment, you know, to a mission, but, but it's interesting because you do leave the job you had before and you become a NASA mm -hmm. employee and you work for NASA as an astronaut, but most of your time is down here on the ground doing other stuff. Doing other stuff. Yeah. yeah. So interesting. So, so yeah. what is the training involved to become an astronaut? What kind of things do you have to go through? How long is the process? Yeah, it's a lot. It's like <laughs> it's a lot. Okay. It's continuous, really. You know, at first, when you first get selected, you're actually called an astronaut candidate or what we joke around like as an ass can. And uh, <laughs> yeah, that. you know. And, and then my husband jokes, there are those that put the ass in astronaut. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> no, it's okay. Anyway, um, but, but you do a lot. It's a lot like going back to school at first, you know, learning all about the spacecraft you might fly on, all about how to do spacewalks and fly the robotic arm and what the systems are and things. And I would say probably the most difficult thing for me, though, was learning to speak Russian. Uh, yeah. So I... I somehow had gotten all the way through school without ever taking a second language. So when you're 40 and you're trying to learn to speak another one and it's Russian, that's a little bit difficult, but um, yeah. Why Russian? Well, because on the International Space Station, we were partnered with 14 other countries, you know, five different space agencies, international space agencies are partnered together. Ru Russia is one of the main partners. And the reason primarily that we learn all astronauts, regardless of which country you're from, <laughs> on the station learned to speak Russian is because our rescue vehicle has always been the Russian Soyuz spacecraft. And that's all in Russian. Wow. So the procedures, the communication with the ground, all the instrument panels, mm -hmm. all in Russian. So you have to learn to speak that. But otherwise, the official language on the space station is English. It's which, English. So basically, which it's very nice. <laughs> wow. So you were learning Russian for an emergency, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Basically, if I had to get home on that spacecraft, I would need to know how to communicate and operate with the procedures and all of the, the instruments. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. A little bit scary, too. But um, so uh. what else besides learning a new language at a time that you didn't, you know, you don't imagine learning a new language? What are sort of the physical requirements? And is there anything, I don't know, is there like any active preparation? Does that make any sense? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I, I would say the most physical thing that we do as as astronauts when we're training is to prepare to do a spacewalk. Okay. And that's because, of course, you can't go to space to learn how to do a spacewalk in space or anything else in space. You got to do it all. Yeah. You gotta, sadly, you got to do it all down here. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, we train in this big, this ginormous pool. It's like 200 feet long by 100 feet wide. It's 40 feet deep. It's got this mock-up of the space station in it. Mm. And we put on the same suit that we would wear if we were doing the spacewalk for real. And those suits That's down here weigh about 300 pounds. So I know. Wow. So you get in this suit, you know, this big bulky suit, and they lift you with a crane into the water. <laughs> And then they try to get you all neutrally buoyant so you can kind of float around. But you're still working against all the drag of the water. You're still, yeah. you know, trying to, I mean, it's, it's really, it was the most physically challenging thing I think I've ever done. And we would be in that pool in that suit for six hours. Oh, man. Working just like we, and you had to have a happy face. <laughs> right, of course, of course. <laughs> You had to go all pleasure is the pain kind of thing yeah. because you just had to, unless you were hurting yourself, you needed to figure out how to, how to work through it. So right. right. That it, makes sense. It, yeah. It was the inspiration to go to the gym for sure. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so is that connected to Nemo or is that completely separate from that? Well, I mean, I think it's all connected in a way because like when we went and did the Nemo mission, when we lived, lived underwater for 18 days, mm -hmm. that was all meant to be an analog to what it would be like to live and work in space. Mm -hmm. And it was absolutely the best, I think, the best preparation for overall what it was going to be like to live on a space station because... You know, when you're in space, you're in this extreme environment. You just can't go home at the end of the day, you know, hop in your little spacecraft and go home. You've got to, if things are going normally or if things are going wrong, you have to figure out how to deal with it there. Um, and the same is true underwater. You know, we lived at 60 feet underwater in this habitat that's about the size of a school bus. And 
Uh, once you're down there for an hour, you can't swim safely to the surface because your body's all saturated with nitrogen. Right. So you've got to you've got to deal with stuff there. And we did science and exploration stuff just like we would if we were in space. It was amazing. Wow. Yeah. So is the buoyancy in water, was that an analog to being in space? Was that really, I mean, I, I imagine that that sensation is completely different, those kind of similar. So how would you? Yeah. <laughs> Kind of yeah, that's why I like it's completely different, but kind of <laughs> that's a great. I mean, it really is a great way to put it, actually. It's, I, you know, I think it actually is the best that we can do down here to try to, you know, mimic what your body's going to feel like when it's moving and microgravity and, you know, just that floating of it all. Um, however, here, you know, we still have, even in the pool, you've got gravity. So your body wants to write itself, you know, oh, it wants uh -huh. to, you know, you want to be like, <laughs> You, you just get this sense of up and down. In space, right. we don't have any of that. No, there's no sense of up or down. And, um, and like I said, the drag in the water mm -hmm. that you feel, you don't feel any of that in space. I mean, it's, it's almost effortless to move in that suit when you're in space. Even though it's 300 pounds. Yeah, even though it's, it's still got all that mass though. So if you get moving, you got to know how you're going to stop yourself. Because it's going to want to keep good going. That's a good point. Yeah. You never think of that. Yeah. Huh. So how do you stop yourself if you're moving? Well, what you do is you don't get moving too fast. First okay. of all, you, I mean, you really try to be very deliberate about all of your movement. And actually, as I was watching you, you know, conduct the orchestra you know, for the <laughs> symphony that we were at together. I mean, it's like, there's, you know, to me, I, I wonder what you're doing. You know, I look right. so <laughs> just graceful and effortless. And yet I know there's, you know, with in your mind and mm -hmm. for the musicians that you're conducting, there's a very, you know, there's a method to the madness. They mm -hmm. know what every little movement means. You've got that kind of planned out. And we do the same thing when, um, when we're doing a spacewalk. Huh. Yeah. So you spent 104 days in living and, and traveling in space, which seems an incredibly long time. And <laughs> so what aspect of life on the ISS and just being in space for so long was the most challenging, do you think? Wow, I think, um, and I don't think it has to do just with the, having been in space. I think it's just being away from my family. You know, my son was seven years old when I flew oh, the wow. first time and I was on the station for a little over three months that time. And I think, I think that's just it, that how, you know, how you manage this, you know, what's going on with your family on the planet and yeah. you know, you're in space. And the same things happen when we're on business trips or we're away for an extended period of time that way. But um, I think that was it. And then um, I think if I, if I ever was like stressed about anything or if I really had a fear of something, it was that something might happen to them here on earth and I would not be able to get there. Wow. You know, that, that, and I know everybody's like, oh, weren't, you know, weren't you afraid of a hole in the side of the spaceship <laughs> or a fire or something? I'm like, right. no, you know, because we train for that. I mean, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. as much as what, you know, like humanly possible that you could deal with something like that, we've, we've trained for that. I mean, I don't think we ever train for something happening to someone, you know, someone we love. And that's, mm -hmm. you know, so that to me was the kind of, if there was any fear, it was like, oh my gosh, what do I do if something happens, you know, to my family on earth and I can't mm -hmm. be there? That's a great perspective. I don't think people think of it that way, but yeah, but that's some business trip that you're on, you know, it's not yeah. like you're in a Toledo or something, <laughs> right? Um, well, yeah. So how do you tell a seven-year-old that you're going off into space, if I can ask? Well, I think what you do is you don't just wait and tell them. I think you involve them in the whole experience. So, you know, I was traveling over 50% of the time when I was preparing to go to the station the first time. So I'd go to Russia for a few weeks, be home for a few weeks, Japan, Europe, Canada, you know, all for about a three year period, over 50% oh, wow. of my time. So pretty much as long as he was growing up, I was, <laughs> you know, You're doing something. Yeah. yeah. And so I'd try to take him with me as much as I could so he could see what I was doing, meet the people that I was working with. Um, if we were doing, you know, one of those spacewalk training things, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at work, I'd try to get him out there to see that. I really tried very hard for him to feel like he was part of my crew, you know, so that right, he right. understood it that way. And, um, and that, yeah, and I don't, but I don't think anything really prepares anyone for saying, hey, I'm going to go to space for three months. I'll see you, you know, in a <laughs> hundred days or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but by doing that, like involving him, so he 
you know, when they're little, they get it when they're even when they're little like that. I mean, they really do, you know? And so um, I, I think it's our, I mean, we're obligated, I think, to yeah. include them in that. Yeah. Absolutely. Huh. Yeah. So I have a question from a listener. I'm going to rephrase it. Um, but did you encounter any issues because of gender? You know, I never, I, I mean, I'm very thankful. Um, I never really have like vivid memory of that being a problem mm -hmm. um, at all. Um, and it's funny because like before I flew both times I, and I was the only woman on my, on my cruise. And it was weird because the only time I would think about it was if somebody asked me, hey, Nicole, what's it like to be the only woman on your, <laughs> you know, on your crew? And I'm like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not really, it's not really something that I'm thinking about. And I mean, I try to tell kids, you know, it's like, hey, the rocket ship doesn't care if you're a boy or girl. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't care. And it's just the humans around you that are going to do these wacky things that might make you think that you should care. You don't, mm -hmm. you don't need to care about that. And I, I really, and I don't know if it's just NASA human spaceflight stuff, and I was just fortunate to always be involved with that. But honestly, I never really felt it. And I know that's not true for everyone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, you know, I do remember a story before I got to, to space the first time. So it was all guys up there that I was joining mm -hmm. on, right. on the crew. And the commander was um, a Russian cosmonaut named Gennady Padalka. And one of my U.S. crewmates said, oh, yeah, Nicole, you know, before you got here, Gennady told all of us that we were going to have to put our shirts on to come to dinner now because <laughs> you were going to be on board. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you know, I hope I didn't cramp your style. He probably wanted to have a shirt on anyway, you know. Good. Right, right. That's funny. But, uh, you know, that's yeah. more camaraderie than anything, right? And yes. that's, you know. And that's remarkable that you didn't yeah. sort of run up against any issues. You know, I have heard from women, especially in this, you know, in STEMs and, yeah. you know, of really running up against issues. And it's, I think it's fabulous that you didn't have those experiences. And that I love this description of the rocket ship doesn't care if you're a boy yeah. or girl, right? Which and, I always... you know, I do think, I do think young women, maybe you've seen it as well, you know, with, with what you do is that I think, because I don't like to stereotype anything, but I do think young women are more see it, be it. Like mm -hmm. they, I get this sense from the young girls that I, you know, encounter that they are looking for somebody to be present for them, for examples <laughs> of someone that might look like them, you know? Yeah, exactly. And my son, you know, I'd go to career day, he and his, his friends, they, they didn't care if, who was standing up in front of them. If they thought it was cool, they just wanted to know if they could do it. They weren't right. looking to see if it was a man or woman talking mm -hmm. to them about it. And so I think it's really, even though I didn't experience it, mm -hmm. I think it's really, really important that we do make ourselves presence, that we make our presence, make ourselves present, right. make ourselves available, yeah, yeah, you know, visible to young women to see that, you know, something they might be thinking is completely unimaginable mm -hmm. or impossible, you know, help them believe that it isn't, you know, so. Right, because they can yeah. see it in action, in motion. Yeah. I think it's really yeah. powerful. Um, so you talk about these shirtless guys on the International Space Station. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but what was that experience like? And you mentioned uh, living and working with astronauts from other countries. Do you know each other before you go up there? Or do you just land up in the, in the ISS? It's like, hey, we're going to live yeah. together. The <laughs> How are you doing? Yeah. Um, yeah. No, we all know each other. Actually, you know, even internationally, it's a pretty small community. Uh, you know, right now, the NASA astronaut office, I think, is like 42 active astronauts, probably about the same on the Russian side, a little smaller in the European. So, you know, overall, there's probably less than 150 total active astronauts right now. And so within the International Space Station community, too. And so you're even if you didn't train with each other, like purposely before getting there, you would have at least encountered each other somewhere along the way. But we try really hard to have crews work together down here on earth and kind of figure each other out before getting to space and that's i think that's more important from the like the emergency response kind of thing mm -hmm. you know something's really hitting the fan you know at three o'clock in the morning you get woken up with the klaxon alarm going off right you want to know what to expect from your crewmates and mm -hmm. okay. and we you know we train the heck out of that down here on earth and i was so pleased to see 
you know, when the alarm did go off, everybody just kind of floated out of their crew compartments, <laughs> got there, started doing it. They, they, everybody did what you would have expected them mm -hmm. to do. And that's, that's a really comforting, you know, thing to have happen when you're, you know, the yeah. only yeah. thing between you and the deadly vacuum of space is that thin metal. Yeah. It's an amazing thought. Yeah. Wow. A little scary for me, but um, <laughs> <laughs> so what are what are the kinds of things that you've done in space on the ISS that the, the lay person wouldn't imagine that you have to think about, worry about, do every day? It, it can be like a just a basic life sustaining thing or just, you know, I don't know, traditions you have or, or you know, things that you do yeah. that you would not imagine. I, you know, not imagine, I don't, you know, I think um, one of the things that even though you know it's going to be this way when you get to space is that everything floats. <laughs> <laughs> and it's kind of this obvious statement, right? But mm -hmm. you float, all your stuff floats, water <laughs> floats, mm -hmm. you know, th those kinds of things that really require you to think differently just about how you normally operate you know mm -hmm. if, if i'm going to be working with i'm writing with my pencil i if i let it go it's going to float and it's probably going to float away so mm -hmm. i've got to got to keep track of your stuff like i've uh -huh. never you know thought about down here and and then the floating water thing i think is just i don't know i think it's just the coolest way to think about being <laughs> in space is to have you know, this like really visual kind of representation of mm -hmm. what being in microgravity is like to have this floating ball of water and then to not have running water for a shower. So you use those huh. balls of water, like you can squirt out like a hot ball of water that's like this big. I mean, it's <laughs> seriously, uh -huh. yeah, and then you can, you can stick your arm through it. Whoa. <laughs> it'll make a glove of like water on your arm. And unless you shake it off, it's going to stay on there because there's no gravity to pull it, pull it off. And then you just mush some soap around on it and then put your arm through another ball of water and dry it off. And you can squirt, you can squirt water onto your whole body and make like a glove of, it's just the coolest thing that because of the way it behaves. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you actually showered in space because you can. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was the thing. It's like, I kind of looked at it like it's all going to be a little bit different, you know, uh -huh. um, it's just kind of the way you live up there is just different. And I don't think you want it to be like mm -hmm. exactly the same as it is down here. Mm -hmm. You know, that's part of yeah. the adventure to have it be different. And so not that I didn't want the nice hot running water shower when mm -hmm. I got back, but I never felt like I couldn't stay clean or that it wasn't, you know, yeah. a nice way to, you know, to take a, I don't know, glorified sponge bath, I guess. <laughs> You know, I mean, I used to, I joke with kids that, you know, literally or technically you could squirt out a big enough ball of water that you could put your whole body in it and then come out and all that. But that would be really, we don't do that because it'd be very messy. <laughs> with yeah. just little droplets of water. Everywhere. 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 Yeah. yeah just everywhere. Yeah. Um, so I met another astronaut, Leland Melvin. We actually did yes. another symphony concert last year. And I, I noticed the two astronauts I know that there's a lot of commonalities. I mean, you're both incredibly intelligent and really nice people, but you both of you seem really unflappable, like stuff just doesn't get to you in a way that it might get to other people. So I'm wondering what the psychological profile for an astronaut must be, because I imagine that you don't want someone who's going to, you know, panic in space to take it as an extreme but you want you know what type of person does it take to want to go up there and to be able to go up there yeah I think that's I mean I think that's a really good point you know when I look around when I think now about like all my colleagues um in the office everybody is pretty much you know not that you just let stuff roll off but you mm -hmm. just take it in deal with it and say okay do I need to worry about this or not you mm -hmm. know um and, and then in emergency situation, you absolutely want to know. That's why I was so, I mean, I was so proud of my crew, you know, I was like so happy to see that, wow, we just did what we, we trained to do mm -hmm. and nobody was freaking out about it or, you know, you didn't have to duct tape anybody to the wall to keep them from <laughs> losing it and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was really, I, I, to this day, I don't know how they really screen us for that. For that, hmm. you know, I wouldn't have really known that about myself, you know, for sure. Um, through I think the assessments that they they did with us, but there must be some way that they can figure that out. Um, 
I think a lot of us before coming in have done things like, um, I don't know, flying, mm -hmm. scuba diving, right. things that take you a little bit out of your comfort zone where mm -hmm. you have to be, I think you, you do this too, you know, you can't just be thinking about all kinds of other stuff, you know, when you're up on, <laughs> you know, with the, you've got to be in it, you know, yeah, and yeah. Um, aware, situationally aware of what's going on with the musicians around you and, mm -hmm. you know, the music. I mean, that's the same thing that we have to be, you know, and so you have to be able to shut out the unimportant stuff or not be burdened, I guess, by thinking about all kinds of other things when you really need to be focused on. Um, you know, some other task at hand, but, but we know how to have fun too. Yeah. So what kind of fun <laughs> did you have? Well, I'll tell you what, just floating is fun. You know, just mm -hmm. being able to, I think about it now, like, um, to fly, you know, just to be <laughs> able to move that way in three dimensions, just effortlessly mm. incredible. And to, I mean, we would, you know, we would do silly things like, you know, play with those balls of water and put gummy bears in them and spin and wrestle it all in at one time. And, I love it. You know, and I, I mean, you know, silly things like that, um, you know, playing with food. But mm -hmm. I think our fun really was, you know, heads butting in the window, you know, mm -hmm. just earth gazing, looking at the yeah. planet, talking about how we'd solve the world's problems, you know, all that Mm -hmm. kind of thing um on board and and if you weren't a photographer before you got there you become one you know because you just want to cat you just want to capture everything mm -hmm. you're seeing you know yeah and so yeah so that's yeah. A good, i'm gonna pivot here to talk about wanting to be a photographer you are an artist and you are quite famously the first person to <laughs> ever paint a watercolor in space so <laughs> how did you come to art um was that always a passion of yours uh, I grew up, I mean, I always like doing kinds of artsy, craftsy things, you know, and um, I thank my mom for that. You know, if I was going to mm -hmm. get to an art class or if I was going to get to ballet or to my softball mm -hmm. practice or whatever, it's because my mom, you know, got me there. Yeah. And um, and then I joke, too, that, you know, she made, I, I think she, when my sisters and I were young, she made almost all of our clothing. I mean, I can't even no. think about, I could barely, like, get to Target to get my son some <laughs> new underwear, let alone... You know, the yeah, idea the clothing, of making yeah. clothes. <laughs> <laughs> but there was always, you know, some kind of creativity going on around. And um, and so I enjoyed that all growing up. And I liked woodworking and, mm -hmm. you know, as well as like painting and stuff like that. But, you know, later on in life, I really kind of shifted to, to liking drawing and painting. And mm -hmm. so when I was going to go to space, um, thankfully, one of the people that helps me pack, you know, or helps you pack your stuff to take... Um, and we were allocated like this little bag of personal things. Like, so I could bring a t-shirt for my high school or, you know, pictures of my family and friends that I could take a picture of in space right, to right, right, you know, right. have as a memento for them. And um, one of these people reminded me that I'm going to be, I wasn't just going to be working there. You know, I was going to be living there for months and that I should consider bringing something I might enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I thought, oh, I'll just take a little, you know, watercolor kit with me and you know, paint if I get some free time. And I'm so thankful that I did. I really, I feel like that kind of thing, you know, we've had music in space since as long as I can think of. Um, actually, people have been doing, you know, art in one way or another up there since the very beginning. And I think it just kind of puts the human in human space flight. You know, it's, <laughs> it allows you to you know, release in a different way to be, you know, really to be who you are while you're there as well. Right. Um, yeah, form um, of expression. And also, yeah. I imagine that you can't exactly look out the window and paint what you see because it's <laughs> going by really fast, right? It is. Yeah. The whole, so, I mean, the whole experience of painting with watercolors, I didn't really think about it too much. I just thought about it. Okay, am I going to bring watercolors or acrylics? Well, acrylic will be really messy if I do that, yeah. just too much with yeah. brushes and all that. And so I brought the watercolors, but then it's like you're dipping your brush into these little floating balls of water and you're, yeah, you can't, you got to print out, you know, on scrap paper what you're going to paint because at five miles a second, you're not going to, I mean, you're not going to get the brush to the paper before, you know, what you're seeing out the window is gone. And um, yeah, it was a really cool experience. Um, I wish I would have videotaped it. I, uh, I have one picture of painting in space that one of my crewmates took just kind of coincidentally. And uh -huh. 
I don't, I don't know why I didn't think about it that way. I guess I was just in the moment of it. I wasn't really worried about, oh, how am I going to share it later? Or what am I going to, you know, right, right. remember it? It was just, okay, I'm painting in space. <laughs> right. Well, I, I think that's great because that's what it was yeah. for, right? To sort of, you know, yeah. in touch with yourself and your humanity. And it wasn't for anyone else, but it was for you, yeah. which I think is really cool because um, ours should be personal. Um, yeah. I, there's a question from a listener who said, um, oh, what movie do you think is an accurate description of space? <laughs> do you get this question a lot? I do, and I really never know how to answer that. I mean, there's some movies that have done a really, you know, like The Martian that was done a yeah. couple of years ago. They tried really hard to base as much as they possibly could. I mean, Andy, who wrote the book, in the book tried to do this too, base it on as much science as they could right. you know, without over, I mean, there was a lot of drama in it too, but, um, you know, Hollywood license. but. But they tried really hard. Um, um, in some movies, like I'll, I'll use one um, that will seem a little weird. So like Gravity, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. absolutely. I mean, pretty much nothing about the story or the physics or mm -hmm. any of the science of it. I mean, I, I cringed at that part. But the graphics, I mean, the, the, mm. the way she moved in space, mm -hmm. the light on the spacecraft, I mean, all of that was, I'm like goosebumps thinking about it, it was so well done. <laughs> that was so well done. But when I think about um, like space movies that I tend to think about them more from like the human interaction side. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the, the two that really come to mind, which um, have no scientific like <laughs> at all, <laughs> Because their comedies are <laughs> Galaxy Quest and um, Rocket Man. And it's just because of the way, I mean, there's humans doing human things, mm -hmm. like interacting with each other and joking around. But then when they really need to have each other's backs, they have mm -hmm. each other's backs. And I mean, that's the kind of thing that I really look for in the movies. Really. Yeah, <laughs> but that's an accurate description of your experience yeah. in space, right? Which I think is yeah. Um. So I want to talk about Space for Art, which is an organization that you founded, right? Um, yeah. And so tell me a little bit about Space for Art and how that came to be and what, what the impetus was to create that and what you've been doing. Yeah, you know, it's, um, so when I retired from NASA, which gosh, I find it hard to believe, it was like almost six years ago. Um, I mean, my whole thing was how do I find a unique way to share the experience that I had mm -hmm. in space? And and on the one hand, I really wanted, first of all, I wanted people to know that there is a space station, that we mm -hmm. are partnered with like 15 different countries and for the last 20 years have been orbiting the planet together, you know, peacefully, right. successfully, you know, mm -hmm. like the best example of how we should be li living together here on Earth. And, and, you know, and for people to know that everything we're doing is about improving life on Earth. So I thought, you know, because I kept coming back to that painting I did in space. Mm -hmm. And I kept that, you know what? Art is just like this universal communicator, right? Mm -hmm. You can talk to anybody about whether they like your art or not, you right. know, which really wasn't all that important to me. It's like, mm -hmm. if I can share the backstory of what's going on mm -hmm. in space with people through that, then that'll be a really, you know, that'll be a meaningful thing for me to yeah. do. And... As I was starting to do that, um, one of my friends from the Johnson Space Center in Houston reached out to me and said that there was a gentleman from one of the local hospitals, an artist who had started the art and medicine program there, who wanted to do a, a space theme project with mm -hmm. the kids. And, and honestly, his first thing, his name is Ian, Ian Sion, and he's just amazing. Um, and what he really wanted to do to get that going was he wanted to be the artist in residence on the space station and <laughs> work a project from there. And I'm like, dude, stand in line, you know? Right, right. <laughs> That's not happening anytime soon. So we kind of brought it down to working uh, with the kids on these art space suits. And he he's like the artistic genius behind these suits. And one of them, it's a little dark here, I know. Yeah, but, I was going to ask. You know, That's there's a flat them. version of one of them back here. and. Um, basically, we went from like working with kids in one hospital at a pediatric cancer center to I think now we're working with children in over 50 countries on our last project. And I mean, really, it's it's space themed art therapy. <laughs> I mean, yeah. in the simplest sense. And we're just trying to, you know, bring kids together, you know, to inspire them with with the ideas of space exploration. You know, these are kids that are going through, you know, what you 
I really hope will be mm -hmm. the worst thing they ever have to deal with in their entire lives. Right, right. And I'm sure you've seen it with music too. I mean, it's the same kind of thing where these kids can kind of, it's like they transcend the experience that they're having in the hospital and now they're in this new place and they're thinking mm -hmm. about their future. They're thinking about these other kids that are participating yeah, on this project together with them. And, um, and then we've had some really cool partners join us like our spacesuit company, ILC Dover, who makes our real spacesuits, volunteers yeah. to quilt together all of this artwork into these oh, wow. our spacesuits. And we've been able to get a couple of them up to the space station and back. And um, yeah, we just want the kids to feel like they're, you know, earthlings, like they're crew on Spaceship Earth and, mm -hmm. and to, you know, bring them a little joy through, you know, through art and space. And it seems to work. <laughs> it's really no, great. It's amazing. Yeah. I, I think it gives yeah. them a sense of expression and also future. Yep. And all these beautiful things that are out there that are possible, which I think is, yeah. you know, expanding for them and actually all of us, you know, and I, Absolutely. I, love, that. I love that you started <laughs> this. And uh, what was I going to ask you? What's postcards to space? So postcards to space was something that we um, that we did. Uh, we were kind of on a like a in an intermediate project stage. We weren't we were working on another space suit, but um, we weren't sure if we were going to be able to get that suit up to the space station or not because we can never promise that what right, we do. Right. We can, I mean, we can never yeah, make yeah. that promise, you know. Mm -hmm. So we had gathered this artwork from these children um, again around the world and. Uh, and we had this this company volunteered again. These wonderful people come to mm -hmm. to you, and you know they see what you're doing. They volunteer to help you, and put together this really beautiful kind of video story made up of all the kids' artwork. And it really was. It was like they were sending postcards to the astronauts in space uh, along with their art. And so we were able to take this whole video music compilation and send that file up to the space station. Oh wow. <laughs> And then the astronauts watched it on a screen and videotaped themselves watching it. And then we could share that with the kids. And, oh, cool. um, you know, so we didn't physically send anything to space, right. but their artwork, you know, went, went to space. And mm -hmm. it was just another way to bring them together. And that was one, you know, I met Ian and that's how we got started on the spacesuits. Um, really wonderful woman named Lolly Lanis who had done this like physical version of postcards. Um, she did this project postcard. You might have even seen it a few years ago if you were coming off the uh, the moving sidewalk in the United Terminal at Dulles. There was this, <laughs> I, I know, I mean, I almost tripped off it. You know, there's this, there was this 30 foot long installation of, it was white with all these little windows that you could look into and each of the kids pieces of art was oh. in each of these little windows. Oh. And she called that project postcard. And I remember taking pictures of it, you know, and through the magic of something like Instagram, she and right. I were able to get in touch and we've been working together ever since. And we've just taken her idea and turned it into a space theme thing. <laughs> it's really cool. It. No, yeah. it's, I think it's amazing, you know, people using their skills and their knowledge and yeah. experience and turning it into something else, you know, using something they already knew and yeah. finding creative ways to, you know, impact the community, impact kids. Yeah. And, connect science and art which i think is yeah. <laughs> i think mean, they're actually really closely tied i think and people sort of they are you know? they are i mean yeah, i look at science and art and they're both based on us wanting to express something right we're curious about something we want to draw it or we want to understand the you know the theory behind it and and then we have to figure out how to tell the story of it and in some ways you know that might be writing out an equation it might be playing some music it might be doing a drawing it might be a false colored image Hubble space telescope image, you know, right. or something like that. But I think they're both based on the very same kind of ideas. And, mm -hmm. and, and I personally think we need our kids to be using their whole brains. So um, I'm happy when we bring these two things together. And, and I really feel like for myself personally, I, I retired from NASA and was on this mission to use my art, you know, mm -hmm. to share the story and stuff. And I've really found that I think really my next mission in life, like I went to space so I can work on these Space for Art Foundation projects now, you know, like bring all of that yeah. together. Yeah. Just seems like it's what I'm supposed to be doing. I love that. Yeah. I mean, it's like your, your act too. You've already had this yeah. incredible <laughs> act. And no, you have, now you have this. I think it is, you know, and it's, it makes me happy because, um, 
I get a question quite often, like, oh, Nicole, you know, you went to space, you've done this thing that, you know, if that's the, like the greatest thing you'll ever do. And I'm, and I'm like, oh my gosh, do I just put the fork in my eye now or, or what? And, but I think about it, I'm like, you know, my son is almost 18 years old. I watch him, I'm like, I'm really excited to see what he does. You know, that would be, you know, I think interesting enough, you know, is the next thing in life. And, but I think we're always meant to be taking the experiences we have and applying them to something even, even more meaningful than what, you know, what we already experienced. And yeah, I, you know, I highly recommend the whole space thing. You know, if you can get there, go, please. It is awesome. It is awesome. And I would go back in a second, but my life isn't over if I don't do that again. And I think it's going to be really good because I can take that experience and apply it to something else too. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, going back to just floating high above earth and we we've yeah. talked about this before and we talked about this during our concerts but yeah. being with all these astronauts and, and crew members from different countries getting along um in ways that the countries that we come from might get along and looking down on earth so what sort of bringing that all together like what goes through your mind um well i'll tell you first of all i think you 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 probably think you're prepared for what you see out the window before you get there. And I've not spoken to anybody who actually in hindsight feels like they were, I mean, it's, I think it's like your, your really good vacations or when you go someplace new and you take a picture and it captures it, but it doesn't quite get what you felt, you know, mm -hmm. when you were there, like looking at it yourself. And, and that definitely was a feeling for me, like just being, like overwhelmed looking out the window and pretty much every time it was a new surprise you know just this glowing stunning translucent iridescent you know planet that you know all the colors you know it's going to be but just like crystal clear and glowing and then you realize like wow that is a planet <laughs> <laughs> you know i mean we don't we don't we know it we know that. Yeah. I mean, we learn it when we're really young, but we just don't think about it all mm -hmm. that often. You know, we kind of put ourselves in our own place. And I really try now, like I'll walk outside sometimes. I know my neighbors probably look at me like I'm a complete wacko, but I'll go outside and I'll just really just stand there and look, like look up at the sky mm -hmm. and like try to feel my feet mm. like on the planet like try to recognize that wow i am standing on a planet in space I and i don't know i think it's all about you said the word it's like about connection and understanding the interconnectivity of it all and how you know that like we are all earthlings i mean this mm -hmm. is our our home and you know we get so wrapped up in borders and all of this stuff and really the only one that matters is that thin blue line Mm -hmm. that blankets and protects us all. And um, if I, if I, if, if, if I have one mission in life, it really is to share those three things. You know, we live on a planet, we're all earthlings, you know, this thin blue line idea so that more and more people can kind of bring that forward, you know, to be thinking mm -hmm. about that a little bit more actively, you know, throughout their life. Yeah. Um, I think it influences decisions in a really positive way too. I mean, I would imagine, I mean, given the strife that's going on in our country and in the world and the challenges, I mean, part of me is like, we should all go up in space, right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> just, yeah. <laughs> just go to get off. Just go. Well, that too. But just go to get this perspective yeah. of, of really, we live on this ball, right? All of us. And so we're yeah. kind of in this together. And I, I love this idea of earthlings. You know, we're not Americans or Russians or whatever we are, but yeah. we just, we're all citizens of earth. Um, so how do we be good citizens of earth? Well, I think we, I think we have to recognize that we have to recognize, acknowledge those three things, you know, the, you know, that, that, that this, this is our home. I mean, we go to space. I think we talked about this before when we met too, you know, we build the space station, right? In space, this mechanical system, you know, that, and we have to, so we can live there. So we build it to, it's essentially a life support system mm -hmm. that's mimicking as best we can what earth does for us naturally. You know, right. this perfectly, right. you know, this planet that, you know, a little closer, a little further from the sun, not so good for us. You know, it's right, right. where it needs to be. Um, it has all the essential elements that keep us alive or can keep us alive if we right. maintain them. And, and that's what I like to think about, you know, on that space station, 
every day we were acutely aware of how much CO2 was in our atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Every day we were trying to make sure that our thin metal hull was mm -hmm. in good condition. Right. You know, that we had enough clean drinking water, that, you know, all of it, that the temperature mm -hmm. was going to stay in a way that would allow us to live. Right, right. I mean, all those things. And those are all the same exact things we need to be doing down here, you know, not taking yeah. for granted, you know. Just turn and I, I think about it now every day when I turn the, the water on in my shower, I'm like, you know, where's that coming from? Mm -hmm. and, yeah, you don't need to be in there for 30 minutes. You know, I mean, like, right. whatever. Just, yeah. just, I mean, they're simple things, you know, and then, uh, yeah, I think it's, I think citizen is such a great word that you use, you know, like citizens of planet Earth. It's, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, we have responsibilities. We can't just be passengers. We've got to take on our role as crew members too, you know, and um, that's the simplest way for me to think about it. You know, whether it's not using the plastic straw anymore or really and truly figuring out how am I going to power my house that isn't, you know, in a way that pollutes anymore or try right. to be part of that solution, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that everything I do is having some impact on in one way or another on everybody else around mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we're connected that way. I love yeah. Remember Earth. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. That all, we do have to take care of each other and, and the vessel that we're on. Yeah. Uh, airing. Um, Anything else you want to share with us before we go? I mean, you've said so many amazing things. No, no, I just want to say thanks for including me. It's really, it was such a joy to meet you at the concert. And I, I, I really hope we'll see each other again. I'm very happy that your sweet dog is doing well. And, oh, thanks. Uh, yeah, I, um, these are the kinds of things I love talking about. So, you know, thanks for asking me. Well, thanks for talking about them. I think it's, it's important to sort of learn about people's perspectives from what they've done, where they've been. And I think it illuminates everyone and, and makes us think in different ways. So I really, really appreciate you being on. And um, for those of you out there next week, we're going back to music. <laughs> China ah, cool. From um, Pink Martini will be here. And the week after that, jazz uh, bassist Christian McBride. Um, and yes, and this interview will be up on my YouTube channel next Wednesday. So you can see the whole thing if you're only here for part of it. Yeah. Nicole, thank you so much. I really, you're welcome. really so much you're fun welcome. to have you on. And Thanks for including me. Sorry, I look like the glowy alien. <laughs> That's okay. It's perfect. It's okay, perfect. Good. All right. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye.